Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have with us uh, Jay Bhattacharya, Professor of Medicine, Stanford University. Uh, very well known nowadays. Uh, he's an outspoken proponent of the risk-based approach to the COVID pandemic. Uh, one of the three scientists who started the Great Barrington Declaration. And uh, you can find him readily on Twitter. He's come out uh, into social media, which is great uh, for an academic, you know, getting out of their uh, uh, little uh, universities and uh, sharing with the rest of the world their knowledge. Uh, I think it was Martin Kaldoff whom I connected with first, and then uh, Jay Bhattacharya more actively. Sunetra Gupta has also been on Twitter, but she's been very silent for a long time now. She's, I think, getting a bit more active. But all these three wonderful, uh, uh, what we call epidemiologists, I suppose. More interestingly, Jay Bhattacharya is also uh, an economist. <laughs> so that's something I discovered later. And I'm sure, therefore, he has got a much wider perspective uh, than probably any uh, epidemiologist uh, in the world about what's been going on and the impacts overall on the, on the world's health, public health, economy, and everything else. So uh, with that introduction, guys, I'm starting off a little uh, chat with uh, Jay. Thank you, Jay, for joining us. Uh, my first uh, issue that I want to discuss with you is about the great hysteria. The one that I call the great hysteria is the fact that uh, regardless of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of measures, the question about lockdowns and so on and so forth, regardless of that question, I think the first uh, issue that we need to probably get a handle on is the actual magnitude of the COVID uh, uh, you know, virus or, or the disease. Um, and uh, I, I've been obviously looking at John, John Ioannidis' work and Miko Paunio's work, and we, you know, they've been the proponents of the, the fact that this is a relatively low IFR, infection fatality rate, uh, pandemic. Um, it's obviously more transmissible, so therefore it has uh, more deaths, even though it's got a low IFR. Uh, but uh, interestingly, the UK government has made a declaration in its own parliament that uh, the IFR of COVID is 0.096% uh, compared with the flu, which is 0.1%, which is basically the same thing. So we essentially find that this particular uh, virus seems to be and there has been so much evidence in this regard, as I said, from the beginning, all the models over, over uh, you know, predicted, et cetera. So I call this the great history. The first thing is that we overreacted. What do you think of this overreaction and as well as the role of PCR tests in creating this hysteria and contact tracing, et cetera? So over to you, uh, Jay. Sure. So, so first, very quickly about the IFR. Um, I, I don't know if I would agree that it's necessarily point, point 0.1. I mean, the, the estimates... Uh, from the seroprevalence studies that I've seen, estimate something on the order of 0.2% before, uh, before the Omicron arrived, which almost certainly has a lower IFR than, than that. Um, point, and that 0.2% is a worldwide median across countries. Um, uh, more important than the actual specific number for a me median IFR, though, is the age gradient in IFR which is the, the centrally most important scientific fact about this, 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 uh, this virus. Uh, older people are a thousand fold or more likely to suffer severe harm from the virus than young people are. Uh, young people, it is, um, it is certainly the case that for young people, uh, especially children, this is much less deadly than the flu. Uh, on the other hand, for older people, this is way more deadly than the flu. So the flu comparison both hides and and uh, hides uh, the key fact, which is this age gradient, which then will tie back in, I think, to the strategy, the right strategy for dealing with this, given this steep age gradient. The flu also has an age gradient, but is not nearly as steep as this one. And so this age gradient permits strategies that were not available for dealing with something like the flu. Yes, and I think I agree with that. Uh, they are the the. The, the figure I cited is the UK government's official uh, data in the parliament. Uh, I'm sure they've got the underlying data around that. So they, well, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of controversy over the high yeah, percentage. I understand, and I think the, the uh, issue I really, I, yeah. So it's oh, sorry, uh, think, whether it's point one or point two, it's probably not the Spanish yeah. flu. Let's just say that it's not. The Spanish yeah, that's flu. it's certainly not the Spanish flu. I see. Other thing is like it it depends on the age of the population. So the reason why I think the IFR is so low in Africa is that the African continent has less than 3% of its population above age 65. And so if you measure IFR in Africa, you're going to find a low IFR simply by virtue of the age gradient. So that's why I, met, I emphasize the age gradient. There's some scientific disagreement about exactly the IFR, the median IFR around the world. 
I think the the order within an order of magnitude with the number you s s wrote is 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 close to the one. I, I say it's a little higher than that, but like you know, people say it's lower. Some people say it's higher. Uh, I, I don't think it's two percent or three uh, percent infection fatality rate, which is you know, in the early days of the epidemic, the World Health Organization confused the IFR and the CFR, put out a number that's like th two or three percent, and essentially panicked the world around that number. You're absolutely right. In fact, I personally had no idea of these uh, things, and I was I was uh, sure that this is about three percent. And I said that you know we're going to have a massive uh, fatalities all over the world. And despite that, I felt I I really said that there's no need for any lockdowns and so on. Uh, what do you think of the the role the PCR test? We never had PCR tests in uh, in the entire history of mankind uh, on such a scale, and this contact tracing. So, do you think they've actually contributed to the hysteria in in a sense? So the the PCR test. Um... It's, it's, you know, the, the way the PCR works, obviously, your audience knows, I'm sure, it's, is, is that it amplifies the genetic material of the virus if it's present. The PCR doesn't test for the entire sequence. It tests for usually three different parts of the virus that are specific to this virus, not found in other, other, other viruses. Um, the, 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 the use of this PCR test as a diagnostic tool is, a, is in, in many ways an extraordinary thing. In clinical medicine, normally, uh, if you use a PCR for di diagnosis, you would need some clinical correlate. So you'd have to say, okay, somebody who has uh, is PCR positive, and then also has some clinical symptoms that are that are uh, suggest that this is the this is the disease. Uh, we've used the PCR test not simply as a clinical tool, which I think is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's useful to guide clinical management of patients, um, but also as a, a, a on a, on a mass scale to track the the, the 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 disease. The major problem with the PCR test is that uh, even after somebody is no longer infectious, the PCR test will stay positive because you have dead viral fragments uh, that that hang around and linger sometimes for months or longer. Um, and so you have the, the, the uh, people that can stay positive long after the PCR, uh, the, the PCR can stay positive long after they pose no public health threat whatsoever. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and the other thing about the PCR test that's, that's sort of ex ex extraordinary uh, uh, in, the, in the way that it's been used is that it's, it's been tied to quarantining broad populations used in asymptomatic populations. Um, so even in settings where, uh, where, uh, where, and 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 the and the and the way that the 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 parameters are set on the PCR test, they've been set to to turn positive um, in a very sensitive way. So, so, so let me let me describe this the science around this because it's really important to understand. Um, the way that PCR works is you have a piece of genetic material in in you, potentially the virus. Um, you double the amount. By, uh, by essentially by polymerizing the a DNA copy of the virus uh, or, the, or the fragment of the virus um, once. If you do it once, you now have two copies. If you do it a second time, well, two times two, you'll have four copies, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, so on. Um, the number of double times you double uh, allows you to take, uh, it, it take to detect a, a bit of virus that's almost imperceptible. One copy of the virus, if you double it enough, will produce a, a, an amount that's actually detectable. Um, now, the way the PCR test is calibrated, it's ca in most of the, of the world, it's calibrated so that it will detect minuscule, minuscule portions of the virus. It'll turn positive even when uh, the virus isn't really making you sick often. Um, and you, again, you pose no risk to anybody. Uh, and, and that was a deliberate decision to calibrate it that way because the fear was that if we miss somebody that's positive, that will cause more damage than if you miss somebody that's negative. That you you turn positive for somebody that's negative, uh, uh, and, and a lot of the, the 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 a lot of the harm around contact tracing, quarantining has come around this decision, made deliberately to have a version of the PCR test that's so sensitive, that it would turn on even when someone's not posing any risk to anybody else as far as disease disease transmission, um, and so and and so what's happened is. Many, many people have been put into quarantine for long periods of time, to, and it has served no public health purpose for many of those people to be in quarantine because of this decision. Um, and the overlying philosophy, the underlying philosophy is let's stop disease spread. It doesn't matter if we uh, essentially put people in detention uh, without any due process. It doesn't matter if many people are put into, into, into quarantining, uh, societies are shut down. 
um, as long as we're doing enough to stop disease spread. Yeah, I think uh, what you've raised is a phenomenal, you know, number of issues there with the uh, diagnostic, uh, the suitability of these tests. Well, I'd never heard of these tests. I don't think anybody, a normal person had heard of these things in the past. And uh, they were probably being done in, in some hospitals somewhere in the past. Uh, the mass scale use of these for non, uh, as a diagnostic tool, particularly to filter out and find even the remotest case. Uh, that reminds me, um, I, I can actually raise it here itself of the Donald Henderson's issue about the smallpox, you know, the index problem that if you don't catch the first case, you basically is pointless trying to, uh, to stop these things through quarantines. And so that's exactly the argument we've been making that uh, how does it matter from the public health perspective, uh, whether you've actually got, uh, you know, the nth <laughs> version of the virus in the community when you didn't catch the first one and didn't stop the first one, because this is a very heavily transmissible virus and it's gonna go do what the viruses do. So uh, we look at the data between Sweden, which had no, uh, which had, uh, no lockdowns and, and the UK, and it's a perfect match between the, 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 the peaks of the two uh, in the two countries. In fact, the COVID death rate is higher in England that's because of the, uh, the negative effects of lockdowns as well on COVID, but the thing is a perfect match. So the UK wasn't able to stop it even once for one minute uh, using all these PCR tests and lockdowns and so on. So uh, do you agree that therefore this whole thing has been a hysteria of, uh, on, on steroids with the, a, the numbers being quoted all over Australia, you know, things like this is a once in hundred year pandemic. This is by the way, been repeated by all the politicians in Australia. And till today, the, uh, Scott Morrison, uh, the prime minister, is basically now claiming that he saved 40,000 lives in Australia. He had a number of 30,000 lives. He's bumped it up to, to 40,000 lives. So when people are using these uh, PCR tests and contact tracing, which basically cannot work, and I want to discuss with you, you know, a bit more about the Donald Henderson issue, how is it possible that contact tracing can stop a respiratory virus? Is it even feasible? And why is it that the epidemiologists of the world, including in Australia, most of them in the government uh, departments, don't understand this basic fact. So contact tracing, um, it, it, it's used very commonly in, in infectious disease and, and can be a very effective tool to break chains of transmission of infectious disease. So for instance, I think it's used in HIV very, very effectively. Um, the, the idea of contact tracing is when you have identified somebody uh, who, who is sick, well, if, if you can find everyone else that they've been in contact with, they're the, they're the most likely people to actually also be sick. You isolate them and then because they're no longer in contact with other people, uh, because you've isolated them or quarantined them, um, the, the chain of transmission of the virus breaks. Um, that's the theory of it. And, and as I said, in some diseases, it's, it's used very effectively. Uh, the problem with this, uh, using contact tracing for this disease is, me, is, is you know, many fold. So first of all, um, the, the disease spreads uh, asymptomatically, right? You can actually pass the disease on to somebody else without, even though you don't, have the, don't know that you have the disease because you don't have any symptoms. So the disease can spread before you even know that you've spread it on. So you're in contact with somebody two days ago and now you get the symptoms well, you, it's already been two days since you, you spread the disease on. Uh, the, uh, the, and the way these contact tracing uh, works, there's off, especially in times of high community transmission, there's a delay in the time between the person that when the report comes in that someone's sick and when the person is contacted. Sometimes it's a week or two weeks delay. So by the time the contact tracer reaches out to somebody in a fast moving respiratory virus like this, it's too late. It's two weeks too late. And you've now identified a bunch of people that have already been through the cycle. Isolating them, if they have no symptoms, will do nothing um, to, 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 to stop the spread of the disease. Uh, especially in the times when you need it most to work, it cannot work. It will get overwhelmed. That's exactly what we've experienced throughout the pandemic. There are also behavioral issues around contact tracing that are that uh, the public health people and epidemiologists really didn't think too deeply about. All right, so if I am sick, and I, uh, I, people, and I, I know that I'm going to have to essentially rat out my friends that I've been in contact with. Well, I may be reluctant to, to report myself to public health because I don't want to put my friends in any convenience. There's no, I mean, for most of the pandemic, there hasn't been an effective treatment. So why does it matter if they're identified or not? Um, at least that's the thinking of many people. And so uh, it's, it's led to 
people being reluctant to get tested. Uh, contact tracing efforts around the world have suffered from the inability to, to actually contact the people that are that are supposedly positive because people won't call the co contact tracer back. No one wants to be profiled by the government. And in Australia, it's been linked to quarantine camps where you're essentially with no due process sent sent away to some, I mean, like I think I think it's in the Northern Territory this happened to, to quarantine camps for two weeks or or or, or sometimes more. Uh, simply because you were in contact with somebody else uh, that, that, that was positive, even if you yourself display no symptoms. That kind, of, that kind of policy is guaranteed to reduce trust in public health and to also fail to stop the spread of the disease. And you're absolutely right, Sanjeev. The, 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 the countries that have done extensive contact tracing to stop the spread of the disease, especially the, in, in these like lar large, large countries, open countries, have, have failed to actually uh, you show that they've made an appreciable difference in the spread of the disease. Uh, it, you know, contact tracing efforts, billions have been spent on it to very little avail. Um, uh, let me talk about Australia just for a bit. Australia and New Zealand, I think, are, are, are very, very important cases. Uh, and I think the, the key thing to understand Austra the, the experience of Australia and New Zealand is that uh, both of them uh, were hit during the summer in March of 2020, their summer, the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Summer tends to be COVID low season. Now, Australia is going through a massive spike now, but ha that has to do with the fact that it actually did maintain close to zero levels of COVID. It has a really, uh, uh, as far as like a, a recovery from natural infection, a, a new naive population. Um, and, and so, but COVID in most of the rest of the world hits in the, win in the, in the winter, late fall, winter. And um, so both Australia and New Zealand were fortunate to be hit with COVID in March of 2020, during their summer season, when COVID spreads less e efficiently, um, the other thing that's important about them is about both those countries is that they were they are both island nations with relatively few entry points, um, and so closing international travel when they did it wasn't too late. It actually did effectively keep COVID out for a while, at great cost to the population. So I think um, both Australia and New Zealand have faced you know, seven, eight, nine months of lockdown um, for, for an extended period of time uh, during, this, during this pandemic. So they, they've kept, they kept COVID out for a while. And I think the strategy was, let's keep COVID out until we have a, a widely vaccinated population. And the hope was that COVID would never hit the shores because you vaccinate everybody and, the, and COVID doesn't spread. Uh, what's, what's happened is that, in fact, you had these eight, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months of lockdown, uh, essentially to delay the time so you could get the vaccine. The vaccine does stop severe disease. So Morrison is probably right. It probably, he probably protected some people from dying from COVID. Um, but I, th I don't know that he protected the population at large from dying. Um, the lockdown itself induces enormous public health harm. But hospitals were overwhelmed in, in Australia, despite having no COVID in it during the lockdowns, because the public health harms of the lockdown are, are, are bad for, for health status. Um, but in any case, uh, the, the, the point is that, the, 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 now that they've opened up, because the vaccine does not stop disease spread, you're seeing, despite two years of sacrifice by the populations of Australia and New Zealand, uh, enormous spread of the disease anyways. That suffering, in effect, was for nothing. Yeah, I think uh, I've lived through that, uh, the worst of the lockdowns uh, in the world, uh, arguably in Melbourne. And I've gone through uh, the ex you know, stories of extreme mental torture. And uh, I've been working on a cost benefit analysis of Australia's lockdowns with Gigi Foster. And uh, uh, the, the number that I've estimated is around 5,000 lives uh, saved among the elderly mainly among the elderly, uh, maybe a few, you know, so few couple of uh, years maximum, uh, you know, saved for them. Uh, at the same time, you've had a large number of non-COVID deaths and I've worked out a range of figures from the ABS uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics data and I'm waiting for Gigi to confirm them and they'll get published. So uh, my, my finding is that because the people who died from non-COVID causes, their average uh, 
uh, life saved, uh, sorry, life lost, the average years of life lost, the quality of, uh, you know, Tuali, et cetera, is far greater than the, than the lives saved. So first of all, Morrison is wrong when he says he saved 40,000 lives. That's not true. He saved around 5,000. Uh, but more importantly, he's, uh, he's led to the loss of a large number of, I mean, thousands of lives uh, of, uh, from non-COVID causes, which are clear in the data, as well as uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, the, these lockdowns uh, prevented, uh, you know, for economic reasons, people from having children. So we had uh, a, a, the steepest fall in uh, uh, fertility in Australia. And, uh, you know, when, each, uh, when, a, when a single child is not born, we, we lose about 80 years of uh, uh, quality of life and so on. So those calculations are all happening right now. Uh, but I think the main point I, I was wanting to sort of emphasize here and I, I, is that this is well known from what I've understood from the literature, epidemiological literature, that Don, Donald Henderson had made it very clear that uh, for certain types of viruses, particularly the ones uh, where there's not much symptomatic stuff like what you said, you know, it can spread even asymptomatically. Uh, it doesn't really work. These things can't break the chain. And uh, what he said, and you've said for HIV, it can, and it uh, definitely can for Ebola, and it definitely can for uh, SARS-1, which I've understood was uh, largely cured or eliminated using this strategy of breaking the thing. But the contact tracing from the WHO guidelines, my understanding is that uh, it's only meant for, uh, for the most part, it's meant for initially understanding the nature of the virus. And in this case, the nature of the virus was very, very clearly understood at the beginning. And therefore, the idea of these lockdowns and, uh, co and quarantines, et cetera, was simply not on the cards. So the damage done, the assessment of that is, is happening as we speak. There are lots and lots of cost-benefit analysis going on. All of them show a massive you know, increase in uh, harms compared to the benefits. So, but, but the issue that I sort of, uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear is that the, the science behind this was basically breached by those so-called scientists of Australia and uh, most parts of the world. Well, Sanjeev, I think it's very important the work you're doing because to document that, I mean, I think it, 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 it's I think indisputably true that the lockdowns have led to the the deaths of more people than than the than the lives saved by them lockdowns. Um, I mean, I think uh, like in, in the case of Australia, uh, the lives saved by the lockdowns are simply as a result of the vaccine being available, right? It's not it, it you, the lockdowns delay when the cases arrive; they don't actually delay, stop the cases from happening. At this point uh, in the pandemic, it is likely that everyone on the face of the earth who's alive uh, for, for uh, in the next couple of years will face the virus, no matter what, what lockdown policies were followed. Uh, the, the arrival of the vaccine allows Morrison to say that he saved some lives. But you know, there's an irony there because the vaccine could not have been developed in Australia. Why? Because there wasn't enough cases to test the vaccine, test whether it worked. Other people in other countries where the, where the virus was spreading had to be the guinea pig so that Austra so the Morrison could have his 5,000 number. Um, uh, and I, I, yeah, well, he said, I guess, sorry, he says 40,000. 40,000 now. <laughs> yeah, 40,000. I mean, I think, I think that, and it's not, I, so I think it's, this is one of these things where like, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a deep, deeply amoral uh, sort of center of that, of that, of, of that claim. Um, essentially saying, look, uh, we'll, we'll, we, we, we were successful. We, wait, we waited till the vaccine. Other people had to suffer so the vaccine could develop, but we did it. Um, I, I think that, uh, that I don't know uh, if once people understand the dynamic there, we'll, 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 under, we'll say that, okay, that was a huge success. Uh, and, you know, I, and I think the other thing about, the, about the, the, the success of Australia, such as it is in preventing COVID, as you say, it's, like, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the number uh, it's that number 5,000, it really does depend on the vaccine, right? So, so if the vaccine had not worked out, which is possible, it's scientifically unclear whether it would have in March of 2020, um, uh, then, then you'd still be in lockdown, hoping still longer for longer and longer. Um, and the, on the flip side, which you said is absolutely correct. The, 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 the public health harm for the lockdown, including people with heart disease, depression, anxiety, uh, suicidality, uh, cancer diagnoses were delayed, so on. J just the fear in, uh, uh, itself has led to enormous public health harm in developed world. Uh, the, the lost schooling, children, children basically lo uh, losing out on educational opportunities has long effects in their lives. An echo that'll last through their entire life, leading to shorter, poorer, less healthy lives. That's well known from the from the the, the health 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 policy, the health economics literatures. 
and the education uh, investment literatures. Human capital development is critical to, to, to long life, to, to healthy lives. And we denied kids that. Uh, that's in the developed world. In poorer countries, the lockdowns have had even more devastating effect. The world is, as, as, you know, as, as an economist, you know, we're, we're, we're an interconnected world. When the developed world shuts its economy down, as it did, more or less, it, har it harms people living in poor, poorer parts of the world in devastating ways. Countries, uh, because of globalization, reorganize their economies to fit into the global economy. And overnight, with a snap, the, global, the, world, uh, of the world's developed economies broke those promises. And people living at the bottom of the income distribution on one, two dollars a day suffer the most from that. The UN has been saying this through the whole epidemic. Uh, they, the estimates are something like 100 million people thrown into poverty worldwide, dire, dire poverty worldwide. Uh, severe food insecurity for 80 million people, uh, hundreds of thousands of children dead from starvation in South Asia alone from the economic dislocation caused by these lockdowns. They are an utterly immoral policy. And we have looked the other way on the harms that have caused the poor around the world. Uh, to, and, and, I, and I hope that there's going to be some reckoning around that. I, I, I really hope so. Uh, in fact, you might be aware, uh, I gave up my job uh, as an economist and I decided that I have to ultimately start or join an, a political party and a movement. So hopefully we will hopefully get there somewhere. Well, you have uh, my vote. <laughs> It's very hard. Uh, the the amount of the, the amount of uh, misinformation that the government has been pumping out. The people are still in desperate uh, fear of COVID. I mean, that's kind of stories we hear is mind boggling. They're so desperately afraid of COVID, uh, we can't even imagine. Uh, but uh, I guess. Uh, uh, that reckoning part will come in due course. This is going to be a very long <laughs> and, and a historical moment for mankind, uh, this particular whole hysteria. What I really was uh, interested in also is your views on lockdowns itself. You know, So I've gone through this literature while preparing a complaint to the International Criminal Court, and I, went I, I couldn't find a single document, a single book or a single uh, article in a peer-reviewed publication that recommended lockdowns or what they call cordon sanitaires or whatever they called in French. Uh, the only examples were uh, of the recent lockdowns were in, were of, uh, in Africa in 1990s and in 2013 or so uh, for Ebola. And uh, the uh, research analysis uh, found that, that uh, the lockdowns really didn't help. They actually caused harm. Whereas the quarantines, the targeted quarantines for Ebola were very helpful and very useful, which is uh, natural because it spreads symptomatically, which is the fundamental criteria for, uh, you know, quarantining, etc. So, can you sort of uh, from because I just want to reconfirm. I asked one of the you know major uh, professors of uh, epidemiology in in in, uh, in Australia about any example in the past uh, where any literature had recommended lockdowns. She waved her arms uh, arms about and and said, "No, the, we had this in." Uh, in the past, and she never gave me examples, and uh, nobody's ever given me examples. Are you, with your knowledge and experience, can you cite to me any example of any book or any literature, published peer-reviewed literature that recommended lockdowns as a remedy for any pandemic, no matter whether it's Spanish flu or whatever? Is, is, is there, has there ever been any recommendation on lockdowns? So, so the short answer is, is there is this the the kind of lockdowns we have imposed on the world for the past two years is unprecedented in history, right? I do not know of any pandemic plan that proposed anything like what the policy that we followed is. It is improvisation as as health policy, as as public health policy. Um, uh, now, if you ask me, are there examples in history where uh, time limited lockdowns have been used? The answer is yes. So, that, for instance, there's been some. Uh, uh, examples of closed schools during the polio epidemics of the 1940s and 50s during times of, of outbreak. But the, the closed schools were for weeks, week, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, not months, not years. Um, the, the, uh, the, there might be examples from the 1918 flu where, again, uh, there, were, there were like restrictions on movement placed during, uh, dur during the very, very height. But again, short local lockdowns, not continuous, not long, long, long lived, and never with a goal toward eradicating the disease. Um, you mentioned Don Henderson. So he's done it. He, Don Henderson, of course, is, is a very, very famous epidemiologist, probably the most prominent and well-known epidemiologist of the 20th century, uh, because he uh, or, helped organize the worldwide effort to eradicate smallpox. Um, 
the 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 kinds of if you read his writings, it's very clear that he understood that a lockdown of the sort that we were uh, that we have imposed w- was going to be counterproductive. And because the, the 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 idea that if you disrupt society, you're going to cause all kinds of ripple effects that will hamper your ability to control the disease. That that's sort of a, one of the one of the hallmarks of his thinking, and that is has turned out to be absolutely true. Um, and um, you know, like in smallpox is a good example of this. There wasn't a lockdowns for for smallpox. Lockdowns were the use of vaccinations because we had a sterilizing vaccine at scale, and then over the course of decades, with good international cooperation, whenever there was an, a local outbreak, a team from the World Health Organization would come, often led by Don Henderson. Uh, identify the patient who had smallpox, uh, work to treat them carefully, do a ring vaccination effort to make sure that everyone who came in contact with them with a contact tracing uh, uh, effort was vaccinated and thus stopped the the disease from spreading. That was a focused protection approach to smallpox to to, to eradicate it. Actually, while we're on the topic of eradication, can I mention this disease meets none of the criteria that you normally would need to eradicate a disease. Right. The, in human history, we, we've only, with, through human concerted human effort, eradicated two diseases. One is, small, is smallpox itself, and then another is called rinderpest that affects only cattle. Um, the, uh, both, both required sterilizing vaccines. Both required a century or more of effort. Both had um, uh, viruses or pathogens that affected only a single species. Right, so smallpox was not spread between animals uh, and humans. Uh, that's not true for COVID. COVID, for instance, uh, is spread to many, many other mammals: dogs, cats, bats, mink. Eighty percent of white-tailed deer in the United States have evidence of of, of, of antibodies to COVID, the the, the COVID virus. Eighty percent. Um, so this is not a disease where even if you were to eradicate it among humans, you would actually eradicate it because animal populations still have, have are reservoirs for it and it would be reintroduced in the human populations even if you were to eradicate it. The dream of eradicating it is not possible. The dream of eradicating <laughs> is not possible. And, and we should tell that to Scott Morrison and the chief health officers of Australia who supposedly have some medical degrees. I really don't know what they were taught. Uh, we'll come to that uh, about you know reforming the discipline and learning from this whole thing. Um, the the point I just wanted to uh, add. I mean, SARS one was uh, so called eradicated, and uh, from what I read, uh, apparently they had quarantines and they were successful. But of course, no one is con- uh, very clear about how it got eradicated. But but even that did not eradicate the coronavirus itself. So the underlying thing, as you mentioned, was all over the place and it continues to be all over the place. So the eradication strategy was clearly wrong. And uh, what I, I want to sort of mention, which is uh, Anders Tegnell was one of my favorite uh, epidemiologists. I mean, the favorite epidemiologist of the initial part of this whole thing, because I heard every single thing that he spoke on the internet. And one of the things that was quoted uh, in, uh, on 24th June, he said, it was as if the world had gone mad and everything we had discussed was forgotten. What I, what I sort of uh, then looked at the official pandemic plans, you know, the school closure is simply nothing like a lockdown. It's a very well targeted, it's a very well focused. So the whole exercise is a, is a risk-based targeted thing where there is risk, we cut it down, et cetera, et cetera. So that exercise was there in the official pandemic plans of Australia in Victoria, where I was uh, you know, uh, located. And what uh, I noticed is that uh, what you're saying is not new. When I go back as an, I'm an economist, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I, I, I did read here and there. And I noticed that there was never any such lockdown recommendation. There was no such official pandemic plan. Uh, this particular virus doesn't even qualify for the eradication strategies that were being considered. Eradication, by the way, is also prohibited under the Biosecurity Act of Australia, where uh, it said that you know you will not eradicate, you will not bring it down uh, the risk from a virus to zero, and that's for the reason that the cost benefit doesn't add up. So there's a lot of breaches of the law and international law as well, which I pointed out in my complaint to the International Criminal Court. Uh, the WHO guidelines, I went to them in great detail of October 20, 20, 2019. They were clearly against lockdowns and against border closures and contact and contact tracing and I said masks can only be used in a very restrictive setting. So we had a vast amount of literature which was completely forgotten. <laughs> so what I was, uh, I'll, we'll come back to that in a second. And of course, we had this crazy models coming out from epidemiology, which uh, 
created a lot of hysteria and panic and added to the fuel to the fire. So I, I think we'll, we'll come back in a second uh, uh, before we close uh, to the discipline of epidemiology and what can be done to, to reform it because if people forget what they have learned uh, and then the, you know, the torture and, the, and, the, and the, the cause and they cause so much damage, uh, what can be done about this whole thing? And uh, uh, quickly moving on to the uh, uh, hysteria. So I did the analysis and particularly Michael uh, Senger was very vital in, in helping me out in this. And I wrote, uh, co-signed the letter that he wrote about this whole thing, uh, uh, about the uh, role of CCP in, the, in the, fake, the fake videos, you know, people falling on the streets and uh, you know, all that stuff. So that was uh, absolutely huge in, in causing hysteria. So, uh, and then of course, uh, there's a link between uh, that and how the Ted Ross went in and changed the WHO guidelines. So the October 2019 guidelines, if they were followed by the WHO, would never have allowed such kind of a behavior. But uh, Ted Ross actually caused this uh, initial confusion with a case fatality rate, as you mentioned, but then Ted Ross also uh, goes and changes the whole thing and says that, you know, Xi Jinping has done a phenomenal job by using lockdowns. So lockdowns are validated by WHO, the highest body of health in the world. What, uh, I, I don't know if this is your area of specialization, but did you have a think about, uh, you know, the causes of this whole hysteria and why did all this get dumped uh, when it was very clearly there in the literature that this should not be done? Uh, so, so um, you know, I think, uh, l l let's go back to your comments about SARS-1, because I think that played a big role in the thinking of the WHO. S SARS-1 disappeared, not because of co concerted human action, really. We, we really don't know why it disappeared. It, the, the model suggested it would continue, and yet it, 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 it flared up and then it went away. We don't really understand why. Um, there was substantial difference between SARS-1 and this, and this virus in terms of the disease it produced. It did not produce asymptomatic spread. People who got sick with SARS-1 were really sick and didn't go out much because they were so sick. Um, so that, uh, and so, so like some of the actions we took to, to stop SARS-1, especially in, in Asia, um, I mean, the, the idea is that, is that, is that the, 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 the idea in the back of a lot of people's head was that those worked. Why don't we just copy that? Then when, um, when the disease hit in China in like January 2020 uh, or to December 2019, um, uh, the, 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 the kinds of measures they took, which to Westernize, at least at the time, seemed utterly draconian, it looked like it, it kind of worked. Like they, they said that the disease had spread and then it stopped spreading. At the same time, we were getting reports from places like Italy and absolutely horrific visuals of dead bodies in caskets piled up in cathedrals. Um, we're getting reports out of places like Iran. Um, the, 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 the disease was found literally everywhere, almost overnight, especially since after we got the, a PCR test that could detect it. And um, so I think the combination of those two things, the, 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 the history of SARS-1 and China's, the Chinese apparent uh, ability to, saw, to stop it, combined with the visuals of devastating effects of the virus unspread, or what, as, as it spread through Italy and some other, other countries early, panicked everybody on earth, especially it panicked the, the public health people who are professionals and should have maintained calm as opposed to panic. They did panic and, and they, they, they made a virtue of that panic. They said, if you, if you, uh, if they, on a dime in March of 2020, they turned from, let's use our normal pandemic strategies, protect the vulnerable we can, put testing resources where, you, where, you, where it's available, let's work really hard to get uh, good therapeutics available, work toward a vaccine, um, let's, let's uh, not disrupt society because that causes more harm than good. Uh, but while under, and you know, even in the Chinese data, it was clear it was the elderly that was the most vulnerable. Let's work to protect the elderly. Um, instead of that, overnight it went to the IF, the, 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 the mortality rates three percent. We must lock down just like China did if we are going to so survive this, or else there'll be millions of deaths in the United States. You know, hundred, uh, hundred, uh, you know, uh, there, there'll be there'll be like a catastrophic uh, die off in the next two or three months, unless we lock down. 
um, the, 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 what was never made clear to the population is that even those pandemic models that suggested that locking down would reduce mortality rates never actually said that they would reduce mortality rates. What it said was that it would put off mortality rates, it would put off cases to the future. Well, as soon as you opened up, the cases will come back, is what those those, those estimates uh, suggested. Um, and that was right. That's exactly what happened. When uh, the, the, the idea that one could maintain a continuous lockdown of the world for two years was, was a fantasy, um, a very devastating fantasy. And, and you could see the, 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 the folly of it in places like India most sharply. If you are, uh, have a job that you won't lose, because you are, because you're relatively well off, the job can be replaced by Zoom, uh, can be done by Zoom. Yeah, lockdown is feasible for you. But if you're not, which is the vast majority of the world, lockdown is not feasible. If lockdown means you starve, your family starves, you have to go work, whether you're old and vulnerable or not. It was a, it was a trickle down epidemiology policy. That's what it was. A policy aimed at, at stopping, at, at, at essentially protecting the relatively well off many of whom were young uh, you know, IT professionals at the expense of the world's poor, the world's working class and the world's vulnerable. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a, I think it's gonna be a, quite a lot of uh, research going on on what exactly happened. And uh, apart from the fact that, you know, it's, it's a really odd situation where so many educated people uh, can actually panic and lose their professional um, uh, competence. And so I give an example of uh, the treasury where I worked as an economist. And, uh, you know, I, for 15 years, I worked in the treasury in Victoria, advising all kinds of governments. And uh, we always insisted on a cost benefit analysis uh, for any policy, it doesn't matter what it is, it could come. And that's a whole purpose of, uh, you know, economists, we actually look at the whole society and the total effects. And uh, we raised this matter, a number of economists within the department of the you know, Treasury and Finance raised this is issue with the senior officials. And uh, it appears that uh, everybody in the Treasury also panicked at the top. And uh, no one was willing to do a cost benefit analysis. So I think the, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strange phenomenon where professionals, um, so it sort of uh, you know, casts a big question on the kind of professionals we've been training. And uh, I also noticed about uh, things like Neil Ferguson. So I contacted him, you know, and I said, look, my estimates are my ballpark estimates looking at the data, which was very clear, as you said, in February itself, uh, 2020, is that it's only the very elderly who get affected. So tell me if we were to simply cocoon the elderly or the cocoon word actually he used. I said, if you were to simply ask uh, for a policy which uh, shelters the, the elderly more than the others, what would be the effect on your model? He said, it's only 60% would die. And he said that, but he never publicized, never publicized it, you know? So, so the 60% uh, would be a phenomenal improvement to the current situation without the, the losses that he's imposing through his uh, panicky model. So we had uh, people like Ferguson causing panic, the media caused the panic. It, it was a kind of a, it's a crescendo yeah. from all sides. It became unbelievable how all kinds of professionals, economists, uh, epidemiologists or whatever, and politicians, they all lost their head, but there's one man in the world who did not lose his head. And that is Anders, Anders, yeah. Anders Tegnell. Yeah. And I just kept hearing him and he calmed the population of Sweden and said, you carry on, this is our plan. You'll get, you'll be all, be, will be fine. He was so good at this job. And why is it that our professionals were so bad in the Western world, despite the so-called <laughs> education on uh, human rights and everything, which was completely cast aside. So, you know, that's been one of the, I guess, a big question mark for the future. We'll move on from there to simply, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, cost benefit analysis, I think uh, I just mentioned it earlier, but I think that's one of the things that we, we should be doing more of. What's your view on uh, uh, the fact that, you know, public health, uh, in, I, I asked a lot of people in, in India, for example, uh, Professor uh, uh, Mulail, JP Mulail, JP, one of the greatest epi epidemiologists of India, trained in John Hopkins University, uh, and he also mentioned that there's no such tradition of doing cost benefit analysis in India. And, and, and I think that's been one of the questions. Why is it that the epidemiology, so I'm coming back now to the epidemiology thing. What are we training in epidemiology that uh, causes this kind of a problem? Uh, we don't train them in ethics on human rights. We don't train, train them in cost benefit analysis. People in India are not even aware of these things. Uh, I asked another professor, Bhaskaran Raman uh, of IIT Mumbai. He said, have you ever heard of these cost benefit analysis? He's never heard of it. He's of course a computer science guy, but he says, no, no one's heard of these cost benefit analysis. And I thought, I thought from my experience as an economist, that's the most fundamental policy you know, tool to look at the whole thing. So what's your view on this? And also uh, 
So what do you think are the, you know, overall pros and cons? <laughs> Can you sort of just list them out from your, uh, you know, mind? What are the benefits of lockdowns? What are the, what are the costs? So uh, I think uh, I wouldn't be too hard on Indian epidemiologists. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> epidemiologists around the, wor around the world fail, fail that test to think about the costs and benefits. Um, in fact, it was worse than that. It was seen as unethical to mention harms at all arising out of lockdown. If, if, you, said, if, if you said in those early days that, look, these lockdowns might impose some costs, you were, you were essentially uh, uh, deemed as an irresponsible caring more about money than, uh, than, than lives. What, when in fact, what was at stake was lives on the other side with those lockdowns. The lockdowns themselves Absolutely. killed people. Um, so the, 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 the uh, ethical basis for cost effectiveness analysis is that it leads to the best, uh, the, so leads to the least amount of harm to the population at large. By monomaniacally focusing on COVID deaths, we actually harmed the population just purely from a health perspective far more than we than we that um than, than than the lives saved by lockdown okay so now uh you asked me what what my view is on the the benefits of lockdown i i do believe there's some certain class of people that benefit from lockdown i mean i think uh, there's a large number of billionaires that didn't exist before um uh, that, that uh, post lockdown there are uh, i think uh there are certain classes of people with who didn't lose their jobs in in industries that did quite well during lockdown um that uh the, the, those benefits of lockdown money benefits pertain to a a, 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 a certain class of people, um, not, not the world population at large. Um, as far as the health benefits of lockdown, we already talked about Morrison's Australia. Um, I think th their delaying until the vaccine actually did save some lives from COVID at the expense of other lives, as you said, uh, from, from the lockdowns themselves. Um, you can also imagine um, uh, so the, 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 like the, 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 in the rest of the world, uh, there's some some element of that as well, although there was a lot of deaths from COVID even before uh, before the arrival of the vaccines in in much of the rest of the world. There's I, I did a study with John Enides and and um, and Aaron Ben David uh, where we looked at uh, Sweden's uh, response and South Korea's response, which didn't focus on lockdowns or mandatory stay-at-home orders relative to other countries that did, and found no evidence that the lockdowns actually delayed much. Of anything in terms of, of uh, did, did much in those those kind those kinds of drastic lockdowns did much of anything in terms of of, of, of delaying the cases very much. Um, uh, the the other benefit you can say about lockdowns in some parts of the world with with inadequate healthcare systems, the lockdowns may have flattened the, the or reduced the, the 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 peak of cases, delaying them to later, thus sparing hospitals and maybe saving some lives through that. So I think those those are the benefits, the potential benefits of lockdown. If you're going to if you're going to tally them up, the harms on the other hand are, are catastrophic, and we've talked already a lot about them. Uh, the, the the health harms in particular, and the harms to the to the the um, to the the living standards and um, and life of the poor and vulnerable around the world, to me in particular, are, are something that deserve accounting and have not have not received it. Um, and uh, I have to say, like it's it's one of these it's because these 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 harms happen. Elsewhere, the developed countries don't often just can ignore them. Um, but the, but there's no reason, from an ethical point of view, to to pretend like those harms don't matter, even to the even to the rich countries. Um, India, though, I mean, I think India, in particular, I don't. It's just heartbreaking to me to see what happened. Like in India, uh, the lockdown, the initial lockdown, was cruel on a scale that's almost unimaginable. Right, ten million migrant workers. Who live hand to mouth? You know, they 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 buy coconuts. They sell the coconuts. They, with the coke the money, they buy food for the, themselves and their family, and they buy more coconuts to sell the next day so they can live their life. Well, they were told overnight, uh, we're going to have a lockdown. You can't work here. That means their entire livelihood is gone immediately. Those coconuts aren't going to sell. And then they were told, you need to go back to your home village because ten million of them live in big cities. They don't actually come, not from there, and they were forced with no provision made to walk or to take trains or, or, or some of them bike almost a thousand miles in some cases. And a thousand of them died en route within days of the lockdown order being issued. It's, it's absolutely uh, mind boggling to me that, that a government could issue such an order, but that's what ha exactly what happened in India. Um, and, and of course the, 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 the harms are compounded by the cessation of basic 
uh, public health programs like the treat tuberculosis treatment programs, uh, basic child immunization programs, a huge number of other programs. The the, the harms are so multidimensional. It it I mean, frankly I, I I shudder to think of how to do a comprehensive cost benefit analysis. Well, that's uh, that's really sobering, you know, uh, to to think that uh, professionals. Uh, Highly paid professionals, you know, I, I got, a, I was a middle level bureaucrat, you know, Victoria, there are people who are paid like four times what I get. They are the ones running the whole country. And that's similarly heavily paid people across the world, using taxpayer funds, uh, not providing adequate advice on these fundamental issues. In the case of India, of course, it's a very interesting situation where I, I was a civil great, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, civil servant of India in the, in the Indian administrative service. And my batchmate, uh, the person who got recruited at the same time with me, uh, Rajiv Gopa was the cabinet secretary, who was the senior most bureaucrat of India and very close to Modi, et cetera. And I wrote these articles in Times of India blog and I sent it to him and he did not even, he read them all and they did not, uh, until today he's not uh, you know, taking any actions to, to stop it. So I find that they are, they are part of that laptop class uh, who can work from home and who really don't care about the consequences. And so, the idea of a cost benefit, I think of, of all the things that we can think of, the cost benefit analysis seems to me to be the most important uh, thing that we have to drill into the heads of our students everywhere in the world. For God's sake, please and, come and, down. and do that, and even if it's not a detailed one, even if it's not like complete, perform a, a, at least a rudimentary one before you undertake any action whatsoever. It is unethical not to do so, to like go through the, the exercise to put yourself in the feet of poor people, of working class people and say, okay, what will happen to them if I do this strategy, right? Will, will it actually work? That is a, a absolutely fundamental ethical, uh, ethical uh, 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 principle that, that you need to perform one of these cost benefit analyses before you implement a policy, not long after. Yeah, and I also personally, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian or whatever you call it, very, fundamentally, you know, devoted to liberty and human rights. And to me, this was also a breach of the international, uh, you know, the, the, the Rome statute with the International Criminal Court. And I therefore lodged a very detailed complaint, 20 days nonstop I wrote on, uh, and worked on that. And to me, uh, when you talk of these millions of people who might have lost their lives, and I think there could be plenty of them, uh, we don't know the numbers. Uh, these are, they do constitute a kind of a crime against humanity. And I, I think that's a, that's a separate issue. I won't go into details yet, not in the legal sphere. But you know, legally speaking, I think that's a question mark as well. Uh, I'll leave it there at the moment. I just want to go back to the uh, field of epidemiology and, uh, and what changes we need to make in the, to stop this in the future. So can you sort of tell me, what are your thoughts on reforming epidemiology? I actually had a very high, <laughs> you know, uh, good opinion about epidemiology. Uh, when I started this whole thing, even in March 2020, I thought, hey, hey, Neil Ferguson knows his job. Look, I looked at the differential equations that they've been using. I thought it's pretty scientific and pretty logical. Uh, sadly, uh, they all say ended up in a kind of a hysterical uh, outcome, the modeling. So the modeling was uh, has turned out to be worse than the mo modeling of economists. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you're probably you're aware uh, as a PhD student in econ economics, I, I am aware of the huge pitfalls of a modeling in economics. And I can understand uh, that, but I didn't realize it's also that bad in epidemiology. So one I feel is your, I want your views on modeling. So we've already discussed the cost benefit part. And the third part that you only alluded to is the ethical training, you know, about human rights and things of the sort. So these modeling cost benefit analysis and ethical, uh, you know, uh, training of epidemiologists and uh, also maybe medical doctors who become chief health officers, et cetera. What's your view and how can we, how can the discipline be transformed to include all these uh, reforms? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the modeling is, is, is interesting. I don't, I don't, I'm not against modeling as a, as a way to think about what the trade-offs are for particular policies. They're, they're, they're theoretical exercises in my view. Uh, in the, and same thing in economics, they're, they're theoretical exercises to highlight where the trade-offs are in policy. That, and, and, they're, and for that, they're quite useful. What they are not useful for is social engineering. They are not, there never will be, be precise enough to understand all of the adaptions that people will make in response to policy such that you can, can accurately forecast it and then thus make detailed decisions based on. Um, it's like uh, weather forecasts. They're based on models. 
um, the, the models tell you, well, it's, it seems likely it'll rain, 60% chance of rain tomorrow, right? Uh, and, you know, it's, it, it, it has errors. Everyone understands it has errors. And we make some, uh, we, we allow, uh, allow that to enter our thinking, but it's not the only thing that allows our, to enter our thinking based on, do I take an umbrella outside? Right. If I look outside, it's drop. It, the, the, I see rain dropping, even though the weather forecast said it was ten percent chance of rain. I'm going to carry an umbrella outside, right? Um, so I think um, I think the models are useful, but they've been misused during this pandemic, and they've been um, uh, used to panic the population. They've been used to enforce lockdowns. It's, they've been used to uh, support uh, the, the the whole range of misguided policies. Uh, be, because they focused on one thing, again, monomaniacally only on COVID uh, and COVID spread, ignoring all of the other collateral uh, consequences of the policies that followed. Uh, I mean, just think like most of the models, almost, I mean, I don't think I've seen a single one. Maybe, maybe there won't exist but, that I know about. Uh, they have people as just homogenous, homogenous uh, uh, you know, entities who interact with each other. Uh, like, there means some sophistication about like old interacting with young or so on. But for the most part, it's like these homogenous models where people interact randomly with each other. They don't even have any sense that there are classes of people who can work from home versus classes of people who cannot simply by dint of what, what the, where their status, uh, you know, their social status is in life. Um, none of the, the harms of schooling, none of those things are embedded in these uh, SIR models that have been used to forecast and uh, uh, the epidemic and to control our lives for the last two years. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, it, what's your view essentially on uh, how do you go about reforming uh, edu- the training of epidemiologists uh, in the future? How do we get them to think about these things? Is there a way to have conferences? I, you know, I I don't know that I, I don't know necessarily that you could reform. The epidemiologist. I frankly have given up hope. Um, I, I, I think um, it may even be too much to ask. What, what I would say is that uh, the, the, the mistake wasn't including epidemiologists in the discussion. The mistake was thinking that only virologists, epidemiologists, immunologists have anything reasonable to say about the pandemic. And everyone with any other expertise need not say anything. <coughs> the right thing to do is to expand the set of people and expertise at the table making these decisions and do not empower people with only a very narrow set of expertise. The epidemiologists, uh, it, it, it infectious disease doctors, immunologists, virologists, those are people with great expertise in their area, but they do not have the expansive vision necessary to make the decisions that have been made during the pandemic. And the idea that only they have the expertise necessary to do so has been the source of much harm. So the, the, like, if you're going to ask about what to do in the future, I say the, 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 that that should never happen again. People in, with other expertise, sociologists, uh, economists, philosophers, <laughs> theologians, uh, po- uh, frankly, politicians, um, you, know, you name the expertise poets, they belonged at the table as much, if not more, than uh, the, the epidemiologists, the immunologists, the virologists, the infectious disease doctors. They, they played an important role. They should have played an important role, but they should not have played the only major role in deciding policy, which is what happened. Uh, that's really interesting because it sort of resonates with what happened. Uh, I asked uh, my boss in the treasury, uh, who's the head of the economic division, I said, uh, what's going on in the treasury? Why aren't we, you know, we, we always had a place at the table. The treasury could never be out of the discussions of an, any policy in Australia, in Victoria. And our place was exactly to do what you just said. We would bring the broader perspective. And uh, the, uh, the answer was that the, uh, the secretary has decided of our department, the boss of our department, uh, that this is, a, this is a health matter. And so he stepped out of the discussions and deferred to the opinions of our chief, chief health officer. So maybe that's the big institutional change that you're sort of alluding to, that we need to remind everybody that the purpose of a cabinet form of government is actually to bring different diverse opinions at the table uh, of decision-making. And we also, by the way, had a star chamber in Victoria where the only five ministers were actually making decisions. The remaining ministers were removed from discussions of the COVID ap- uh, pandemic. And so at the end of the day, the, the economists withdrew deliberately from the discussions uh, in, in Australia. And the other ministers, you know, who would be responsible for a range of other things, like you mentioned, 
uh, they were completely uh, kept out of the uh, conversation. So that's the first institutional change is very important. It's actually just going back to the basics. The whole point is why, why uh, fix something that's not broken? So it was never broken. The system where economists would be on the table, other people on the table, sociologists were on the table, very much on the table and so on. Uh, that, that needs to go back. We need to go back to that. Uh, number two, I've sort of come out with a view that we need something like uh, an opposing voice in parliament uh, or in the case of USA, maybe the Senate or whatever, the Congress. Uh, the opposing voice needs to be somebody paid by the taxpayer and completely not uh, accountable to the government of the day. The job of this particular black hat commissioner, I call it black hat person or whatever, you know, he's the devil's advocate. Just look at the alternative view and provide an opinion on that to the public. There should be a well, a uh, well-staffed organization with skeptics like me uh, and maybe like you, uh, who are basically there to simply look at the what's going on and provide the alternative view. Right, like a devil, like a devil's advocate. Uh, I mean, I think uh, that is uh, that's a very, very good idea. And I, I, I think um, the the idea, the, the 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 it's just. I mean, I think it was such a catastrophic mistake to seed the the field to people with such narrow expertise. It, and it was almost like a moral cause. If you anyone else with any other expertise were to speak up, well, no, no, you don't, you don't know what's going on because you're not an infectious disease specialist. That is such nonsense, and it's it, and it's led to so much. Two years of catastrophic harm. Who's going to? You know, I should say that the 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 uh, the distrust that the public now has ha now has about these fields, it won't just stay in these fields. Scientists at large now face a lot of skepticism in the public that didn't wasn't there before. It's going to make the lives of doctors harder. It's going to make the lives of other scientists harder because public, uh, the, the, uh, the, the actions, the, the jobs of most scientists depends on public support, public financing, public support. And if it just, if, it, if, if there is this deep trust of science, which has just arisen because of the, the, uh, the bad actions of a relatively small number of scientists uh, persists, I think that will have devastating consequences in the, into the future. Well, I think that's been a phenomenal uh, conversation, Jay. Uh, we can go on and on. Uh, there's so much to discuss. Um, uh, we'll obviously be keeping in touch through, you know, uh, your Twitter account, particularly. I'll, I love to see your tweets all the time. And I'm, I encourage everyone to watch, uh, to sort of read your tweets and, and get your um, knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we, we, we do have a challenge yet to actually end this whole hysteria. It's not yet over. Uh, about 83% of the people of Australia were supportive of the uh, deportation of uh, Djokovic. So you can imagine a person who's got the strongest possible immunity in the world with uh, already having had COVID. Yeah. He's got a negative PCR test. Uh, uh, Australia already has a vast amount of COVID cases. So it's not that he's adding anything to the whole thing in any case. And yet our uh, you know, politicians, and I would uh, dare say the judges of Australia, the judiciary have completely failed. So we, our institutions have failed. So that's why I call my book, The Great Hysteria and the Broken State. Every single institution that I can think of, every single institution has, yeah. has been broken. And so to, to even to try to get back to normalcy in such a situation is a huge challenge and remains an ongoing challenge. Uh, and what we do in the future, I think, is a, is a matter for great discussion and debate. Hopefully, we will get there one day. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining me, um, uh, Jay. It's been a great pleasure to have you here. I really learned a lot, uh, clarified my mind, and I'm sure the listeners might also you know, have benefited from this. Thank you thank so you, much. I've been, I've been looking forward to meeting you the whole pandemic, and hopefully one day we get to meet in person. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.